welcome back to the Lake Institute for Evangelism. You're, you're joining us here today actually in our class at Pine Lake Retreat in sunny Florida. Today we're going to be going over a study on the spirit of prophecy. We're going to be looking at how God throughout uh, history has guided his church with, with prophets and actually that, that that gift of prophecy actually comes down into the last days of, of, of earth's history to God's remnant church. His last day people also will, will experience that, that gift of prophecy. That's what we're going to be studying today. As we get into our study, before we get into our study, I should say, we're going to have a word of prayer. So let's, let's bow our heads for a word of prayer. Father, I just want to ask right now that as we open up your word and we study this important subject, as we teach others how to give Bible studies using, um, uh, or actually with, with, on the spirit of prophecy and our, as well as our other subjects, that you will give us understanding ourselves. So Lord, please bless our time together, both for those of us here and those that are watching at home. I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, as you look at the screen here, automatically we go to the screen and we find out that the spirit of prophecy is the title of the study. And you'll abbreviate that. Now you remember, as you're going through marking up your Bibles, you'll abbreviate the spirit of prophecy with SP. And uh, so once we get into the study, you'll see how that works out again for those of you that may be seeing this for the first time. The purpose of the study, now is on the screen, the purpose of the study is to show that the gift of prophecy has been given to God's people through all ages and that it's also given to us here today uh, in the last days as well through all ages and uh, as we go to the center part of the study prophecy is a gift from God and he gives it to us because he loves us that's the, that's the purpose of the spirit of prophecy he gives, us to, gives it to us because he loves us the, the, uh, the gift of prophecy as, you, as you've looked in your Bibles and you've studied your Bibles I'm sure you've read that the whole Bible is given to us because of prophets right and God has guided his people throughout history, his church, his people throughout history. He would raise up prophets at just the right time in order to point the people in just the right direction. And he hasn't left us here in these last days to wonder which way we should go. He also gives us a prophet in the last days. And that's what we're going to be going through in this study. Exactly what has God done, even in the last days, with, with this gift of prophecy. Now, um, the list of texts that we're going to be going through is on the screen now. Here's the whole list of texts we're going to be using. There's 16 of them. Uh, plus or minus, a, or actually plus a couple, I guess. Uh, we'll throw a couple of texts extra, so you may want to have a pencil and, and paper handy. For, the, for those of you that are joining us at home, and, and you, maybe this is the first time, maybe you've joined us before, I feel like I need to remind you. What you need to be doing is, is uh, you want to have some paper handy, uh, uh, and, uh, um, just something to write notes on or, or whatever like that. But also, if you would like a copy of the study guides that we're using here, at, what the students are, are using, you might not see them having them on their desk because they're on their computers, but I have a hard copy printed out here. And it's just the, it's the entire study guide for this particular study. So now we're going to get into the bulk, the meat of the study, you might say. And we're going to begin in Genesis chapter 5. Genesis chapter 5 and verse 21 through 29. Now, as people are, as we're turning there, I'm going to, I'm going to share something with you, a, a little personal story. Usually whenever we, we say the word prophet, when the word prophet comes up, all kinds of things come to mind, don't they? You know, um, I can remember when I was a heathen out in the world. And, and I first heard about the idea of a prophet in modern time, automatically what would come to my mind was, was not really what, what the Bible refers to as a prophet, but I thought more of, of what you may call a spiritualist. You know, when I think of prophet, I, think of, I used to think of, anyway, I used to think of palm reading or, or you know, the tarot cards and things like that. When, when someone said prophet, that's just like what came to mind automatically. But as I, as I found out from the Bible, in a Bible perspective, that's not what the description of a, of a prophet is in the Bible. As a matter of fact, those things like that that come to mind, actually God condemns. Now, the, the reason we're going to, I'm starting off like this here is because this is teaching you how to give a Bible study, you know, and we're going to be dealing with different people as we give Bible studies. And, and if you've been raised, like, say, in, the, in a church setting or something like that, and, and you say the word prophet, what comes to mind when you say prophet, Mike, is, is like what, what we think of a biblical prophet because we're, we're in the church. We're understanding that. But I want you to understand that when you're dealing with someone, like, in a home, in a Bible study or something like that, and you say the word prophet... What comes to mind is like Nostradamus or, or you know, one of these, um, these modern-day spiritualists. What, what's some of the names? Is there one by the name of Gene Simpson or something like that? Pa Patty, what is it? Duke. Duke? Yeah. Anyway, you see these people like on Oprah or whatever, and they're, they're like basically fortune tellers. But the Bible doesn't talk about those people when it's talking about prophets. It actually condemns that. But it condones and it has people that, that as we're going to find out as we go through the study, God has a description of what a true biblical prophet would, would standards that they would meet. And we're going to find that as we go through the study. You know, I, I, met, I met a prophet once, or somebody at least claiming to be that. I've met many people that kind of claim that, but one particular story stands out. I was, I was a, a literature evangelist. That's where you go door to door, you knock on doors, and you've seen the blue Bible story books you find in doctor's offices and things like that. And I used to sell those. And, and um, 
I, I, usually we'd run on lead cards, you know, where people would fill out the card at the doctor's office and they would send it in and we'd go to the doors. But uh, one day up in Kentucky, I was in, I was in a sub holler. And a sub holler is where, uh, well, a holler is where two hills come together. And, and it's in between there, that's the holler, where you go up the middle of the hill. That, that's what they call a holler in Kentucky. Well, I was up in a holler working, just knocking on doors, and I went into a sub holler. And that's a holler that's off of a holler, right? And, and I go in there, and it's, it's, a, it's just a whole bunch of little trailers and stuff down through there, and I'm, and I'm going to the doors, knocking on them. And I, and I come to this one door, and, and a lady comes to the door. Uh, we're in the middle of nowhere in Kentucky, and, and like I said, in a sub holler. And uh, it's in eastern Kentucky area. Yeah, that's where I was, in, toward eastern Kentucky, I guess. And um, th the lady comes to the door, and she invites me right on in. And uh, we sat down in her living room, and as soon as I sat down to start showing her the books you know, that, that I was selling, the phone rings. And so she says, excuse me, she answers the phone. She says, oh, yeah, just, just, I'll tell you what, just call me back here in a few minutes. So she hung up the phone, and I, we get right back into it. And I open up the stuff again and start showing it to her, and her phone rings. And, and by the way, all the time that her phone's ringing, she has these three little boys, like this big, this big, and this big. I mean, they're just real close together, maybe, maybe a year apart. And they're, they're just wrestling and making all kinds of racket. They're getting into my case, pulling my stuff out. They're pulling out my shirt. They want, they're trying to get my attention. I mean, it's just, it's just chaotic in the house. And, but the phone just rang again the second time. And she says, oh, yeah, call me back here in just a little bit. So she hangs up the phone. And, and a few minutes later, I mean, it wasn't, I, I just got like one sentence out. Now, you know, as fast as I talk, if I got one sentence out, that wasn't very much time. And so I spoke again, started speaking again to show her the books, and the phone rings again. Now, this happened something like four, maybe five times within, within a five-minute span. And I said, look, uh, ma'am, I don't mean to be nosy, but uh, we're in the middle of nowhere. Is the same person keep calling you? And she says, no, no, it's different people. I said, wow, you must be really popular because, you know, it's just not a whole lot of people around here anyway. She says, well, I'm a prophet. And I said, oh, really? Well, what's that have to do with your phone ringing, you know? And she said, well, my church members and stuff, they, they call and, and they ask me, you know, like if, I, if, it, if it's okay for them to go, to, if it's safe for them to go to the store today and this kind of thing. And I, and I said, really? They find out, they call you to find out if it's safe to go to places? She said, yeah, God reveals it to me and I tell them. And I said, oh, so you're like a spiritualist, like, like a, not, not a prophet, but a, but a fortune teller. She said, no, no, I go to the such and such church and I'm, I'm a prophet there in the church. Oh, so I'm getting really a little nervous, especially with the boys pulling on me and, and acting wild too. And it's just an uncomfortable situation. So I show her the books and uh, she had no money or anything to, to give me any money so, uh, for the books. So I gave her a free book and I said, well, you know, I'd like to have a prayer with you before I go. And so I bow my head to pray. And all of a sudden she says to the boys, hey, we're going to pray. The noise level went up about two octaves. You know, it just went up loud, that much louder. And they just got that much more rowdy. And they're, they're, they're doing this thing. I remember when I played peewee football, we done this thing at one of the exercises called the monkey roll. You know, we had three guys line up, and one would jump this way and hit the ground and start rolling. The other guy would jump over him, hit the ground and start rolling, and he just kept doing this. You know what I'm talking about? Just rolling over one, over one another. That's what it's like they were doing in the middle of the floor while I was praying. So my prayer in my mind, because I knew no one could hear me, I was kind of praying that the Lord would just get me out of there. And, and he did. And, and so that was my experience with the prophet. Not much, I know. But uh, w when my idea of a prophet at growing up was something like that, like someone would call, it was a fortune-telling kind of thing. And uh, so the reason I went through that whole long story and everything was to give you an idea, maybe from your perspective, maybe you're growing up in the church or something like that, when someone says prophet, many people out in the world, the, the secular world, like where I came from, that's what they think of. So when you start talking about in a study, a Bible study, the spirit of prophecy, you have to be very explanatory. You have to explain very clearly that you're not talking about a fortune teller. You understand there is a difference, right? And so this study here, what it's going to do, and I, I love the way this study is laid out, is it actually shows how the Bible, how God would raise up a prophet, and you would, and you would have a timeline, then he would raise up another prophet, and he'd done that all through the Bible. There's a consistency among certain prophets. Now, not all prophets were raised up the way we're looking at, but there was a consistency among, uh, like what we would call major prophets and that, that kind of thing. So let, let us begin here now in Genesis chapter 5. It may sound a little confusing in the beginning, a little confusing, and, and the reason so is because you're going to say, why in the world is he worrying about how old Methuselah was and how old Lamech was and how old these other guys were in the Bible? But it makes sense, so if you'll just follow along. And I hope you at home will follow along too in the same way and not get uh, bored and turn the channel or hit stop. <laughs> All right, let's pick it up in Genesis chapter 5 and verse 21. You see on the, on the screen there, Genesis 5, 21 through 29, and we're going to find out something about a timeline prophecy that Enoch gave us. Verse 21, I'm going to start reading here, and then I'll let somebody else pick up as we go along, okay? Enoch lived 65 years and begat Methuselah. And Enoch walked with God after he begat Methuselah 300 years and begat sons and daughters. Now, before I go any farther, I want you to think about something. Who was the oldest guy that ever lived? Enoch. 
Enoch, because Enoch never died. The oldest guy that ever died was Enoch's son, Methuselah. So, the, so the, the guy that was the oldest guy that ever died was the son of the oldest guy that ever lived. So M Methuselah was the oldest guy that ever died. His dad was Enoch, and Enoch was the oldest guy that ever lived. He's still alive. He, he was just taken off to heaven. We'll, we'll, we'll know that as we read through here. So it's interesting how it starts off here. We have Enoch having a son by the name of Methuselah. And it says, Methuselah, L L Methuselah, uh, 300 years, verse 22 still, and begat sons and daughters. And all the days of Enoch were 365 years. So Enoch lived 365 years. And then Enoch walked with God, and he was not, for God took him. So, so Enoch was taken away. God just took him into heaven. And Methuselah lived 187 years and begat Lamech. And Methuselah lived after he begat Lamech 782 years and begat sons and daughters. And all the days of Methuselah were 969 years, and he died. How old was Methuselah when he died? 969 years old. It's going, be, it's going to be important here in just a few minutes. And Lamech lived 182 years and begat a son and called his name Noah. It's an interesting family line of family there, isn't it? You have Enoch, who was that man after, that, that walked with God and God took him. You have Methuselah, the oldest guy to ever live. You have kind of a, 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 a no-name guy, a fellow you never really heard much of, Lamech. And then you have Noah. So it's a, the family tree there is pretty interesting. Now, what we're going to do here, I'm going to show you something from the Bible. The first guy that, here in Methuselah, his daddy was who? Who was Methuselah's daddy? Enoch. Enoch. And then you know, did you know Enoch was a prophet? How do we know Enoch was a prophet? Somebody open their Bible and go to the book of Jude, chapter 1 and verse 14. Jude, chapter 1 and verse 14. We're going to find out that Enoch was a prophet. We're going to find it out from the Bible. Jude is the, is you go all the way to the book of Revelation and back up one book. And it's one chapter long. So when it says Jude, chapter 1, it's not really chapter 1 because it's only one chapter. You just say Jude 14 because it's Jude, verse 14. So go to the book of Revelation and back up one book to get to the book of Jude. Everybody there? Mike, you want to read that for us? Jude, chapter 1, and verse 14. And Enoch also, the seventh from Adam, prophesied of these things, saying, Behold, the Lord cometh with ten thousands of his saints. Okay, this text is not one you have to use in your Bible study. It is, if, 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 you, make the, if you make the mention that, that uh, um, Enoch was a prophet, and they say, oh, how do you know that? It doesn't say Enoch was a prophet. You can take him to Jude, verse 14, and it says that he prophesied of these things, saying the Lord comes with ten thousand of his saints. So if, if, if Enoch prophesied, that would make him a? A prophet. Perfect. Yeah, no problem, right? So we can say Enoch was a prophet, and he names his first son. Now, this is fascinating to me. He names his first son Methuselah, and his name means something. You know, many people in the Bible, their name means something, right? Um, you, you can just go through, and, and like every name basically means something. All the, all the sons of the, of, of the children of Israel, as, it, as he went through naming his sons, you know, this, this guy's named this because I, he brought me through my sufferings and different things like that. It was just Noah's, Noah's name meant, um, and it says it actually here in the Bible, uh, comfort, I guess, because it says his name was Noah, and let me see, I have it marked in my Bible. His name means comfort or rest. So, so people's names mean something. Methuselah, his name meant something in the Bible too, and it's interesting what Methuselah's name meant, and we're going to look at that right now. If we'll go, we're going to go to the slide here. Methuselah is a kind of a two-part name. It means he, Methu, he dies, Shalak, it comes. So his name means he dies, it comes. So he would walk around, and people would look at Methuselah, and they would re recognize, well, something was going to happen when he dies. Right? When Methuselah dies, something was going to happen. And uh, what was that something that was going to take place? Flood. The flood. We know it's going to be the flood. It was judgment that comes, actually, is, is another way of, of saying that. When he dies, judgment comes, or it comes. And so Methuselah, uh, when Enoch named his son Methuselah, he was giving a time prophecy. That's the point we're making with this as we give the study. When, when, when uh, Enoch named his son Methuselah, he was actually giving a time prophecy. And we're going to look at that as we go along right now. Now, we're going to have to get some, do some math, and I'm not very good at math, so I put it on the screen. It makes it a lot easier for me. Um, if you notice here, on the screen, it says Methuselah lived 187 years. This is what it says in the Bible. Methuselah lived 187 years and begat a son, and his son's name was Lamech. And Lamech lived 182 years. We just read it there in Genesis chapter 5. Lamech lived 182 years, and he begat a son, and his name was Noah. Right? His name was Noah. So if you take 187 years, which is how old Methuselah was when he had Lamech, you add 182 years, you get the age of Methuselah when who was born? Noah. Noah. Is, that, is that pretty clear, pretty simple? Like if I'm 35 years old and I have a son, and my son is 35 years old and have a son, how old am I going to be when my grandson is born? 
70. So it's pretty simple. So if you look at Methuselah, it was 187 when he has Lamech. Lamech is 182 when he has Noah. You add those together, it's 369 years. 369 years. Now we're going to go to our next text in our, in our Bible study here. And I'm going to remind the person. I'm going to remind the person, Jessica, when I'm having the study with them, I'm going to remind them. How, I'm going to ask them. Like if you're in the study, I'm going to ask you, how old was Methuselah when he died? Pick up the microphone and answer me. Come on, you remember it. We looked at it already. He's the oldest guy that ever died. This is 696. Oh, 969. You was close. Yeah, 969 years. That's exactly right. I don't mean to put you on the spot like that. But uh, 969 years old. And, and the person you're studying with will, won't, will probably won't get it right either, so that makes it more realistic. You know? But it, it, oftentimes, you want, to, you want to remind them, they was 969 years old when he died. And, and how old was he whenever Noah was born? 369. 369, right. Now, notice something here. And what, does, what did his name mean? When he dies, it comes. That's what his name meant. Okay, now, go to our next text, and you'll, it'll be on the screen as well. Our next text will be on the screen. Genesis chapter 7 and verse 6. Genesis 7, verse 6. And you'll notice here, you, ha you have the S2SP, which means, you know, two, spirit of prophecy. That's where you're at now. And you'll put a line out from it. On the top line, you're going to put Genesis chapter 5, verse 21 through 29, because that's where you just came from. And then on the bottom line, you'll put Genesis 15, verses 13 and 14, because that's the next text we're going to. And so we're at Genesis chapter 7 and verse 6, and what we're going to find out here is how old Noah was when the flood came. And uh, Bill, would you want to read that for us? Noah was 600 years old when the flood waters were on the earth. So how old was Noah when the flood came? 600. Now, we're going back to the screen here. Interesting. Lamech was 182. He begats Methuselah, at a, and he's 187. He begats or has a son named Noah. And then Noah is 300, uh, uh, Methuselah is 369 years old when Noah was born. And, and once again, your, the text you just read, Bill, on the text you just read, how old was Noah when the flood came? 600. Noah was 600 years old. Is everybody keeping up with this okay? Look on the screen here. Noah was 600 years old at the flood. And so you add 600 to 369, what you, how, many, how old do you come up with? 969. 969. So how old was Methuselah when the flood came? So what happens? Methuselah dies, and the flood comes. You know, you know what Noah's basic message was? Papa's going to die. Hey, everybody, get ready. Papa's going to die. Papa's dying soon. Everybody, get on the ark because Papa's going to die soon, right? His Papa. Did you say Papa in the north and the south and the east and west? They say that all over the place. Papa means like grandfather, right? Grandfa Grandpa or Papa is going to die. He's going to die soon. And when Grandpa dies, when Noah's Papa died, guess what happened? The flood came. And so that was Noah's basic message. And so one day, I can just picture it right now, Methuselah dies. And everybody's like, oh, did you hear the story? Did you hear the news? The old man died. The, did he really? He died? Well, nothing's happening. Well, you know, that, that, that crazy old man, his grandson down there, Noah, that's been building that big boat on dry land? Uh, something strange happened just the other day. The animals all went onto the ark. A bunch of animals went onto the ark. They, they all just on their own went on there and filled the, filled the thing up. And then, and then now, today, the old man died. And then Noah, he got on there with the animals and the door shut, right? The door closed. Strange things are happening. The old man is dead. And you know what happened when the old man died, right? The floodwaters came. So look at this. Enoch is a time pro gives a time prophecy. He says, through his son Methuselah, he says, it'll be a certain amount of time. When this guy dies, then, the, then judgment will come, the flood will come. And then before, before God allows the flood to come, and, oh, man, there's just something, too. I always like to bring this out when I give this study. Don't miss this. Do you, know, do you know what Enoch, I mean, Methuselah shows about God? It shows God's love and mercy. The oldest one that ever lived. Why was he the oldest man that ever lived? No, 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 Methuselah. The reason he was the oldest man that ever lived was because God knew that whenever he died, he was going to bring judgment, and he put it off as long as he could. It was showing his, that's one of the things that show his grace and his mercy, uh, like any, almost like nothing else. You know, you think about it. He, he could have said, okay, I've had enough of these people, and cut Methuselah off at like at 500 years old, you know. But he gave them a complete, oppor every opportunity, he let him live longer than anybody else. Because when he died, God was going to bring the judgment. So God has him live 969 years, and then he dies. And so his name meant that when he dies, judgment will come or the flood would come. And so in it gives a timeline prophecy. At the end of the timeline prophecy, notice this. This is very important to pick up. At the end of the timeline prophecy, God did not leave his people or the world to, to wonder about what was going to happen. For 120 years before that prophecy came to an end, God had Noah faithfully warning the people. So he raised up a prophet at the end of that timeline prophecy to warn the people and let them know, hey, the flood's getting ready to come. 
Papal's going to die. Get ready. Be ready. It's going to happen. It's for sure going to happen. I know you don't believe it. It's never rained before, but it's going to happen. The, the prophecy is going to come to an end. God did not leave his people in darkness. So he gives a timeline prophecy through a prophet. At the end of the timeline prophecy, he raises up another prophet to say, be ready. He doesn't leave him in darkness. God could have said, I'm not going to raise up Noah. They can just figure it out on their own, couldn't he? Just let them figure it out on their own. Then what would have happened? They all would have been destroyed because they were wicked, right? But God did not let it go that way. He raised up another prophet to give them an opportunity. And now we're going to go to our next part of the study. Uh, we're going to go to the third study, third text, at, rather, in the spirit of prophecy. Genesis chapter 15 is where we're turning to. Genesis chapter 15. And uh, Tom, I think, is going to read that for us. Genesis chapter 15, while you're not turning there, verses 13 and 14. And now also, just, just one more time for people marking their Bibles. We want to make sure they understand how to do this. We're not, we're not doing this as, as an evangelistic meeting, understand, right? We want everybody to understand how to mark their Bibles at home. We want them to mark their Bibles up so you can give these studies yourself. The whole purpose of, the, of these classes, the whole purpose of all this, is so that you at home can also give this Bible study. And so if you'll notice here, you write 3SP, you'll circle it. And then you put a line. You don't have to put the line straight across. Remember how we talked about that the, the other day here? But if you put the line straight out, you might not have room to write on the top and the bottom. So you might have to put it in there at an angle. And on the top, you'll put the text you just came from, which was Genesis 7, 6. And the next text you're going to go be going to will be Exodus chapter 3, verses 7 through 10. Now Tom is going to read for us Genesis 15, verses 13 and 14. Everybody there besides me? Okay, Genesis chapter 15, Tom, go ahead. Okay. Then he said to Abram, Know certainly that your descendants will be strangers in a land that is not theirs, and will serve them, and they will afflict them four hundred years. And also the nation whom they serve I will judge. Afterward they shall come out with great possessions. So who's given a timeline prophecy here? Who is it given a timeline prophecy, Tom? This is to Abram. This is Abram, right? And now that, that's before his name became Abraham. And, and what is the timeline prophecy? For how long is it? 400 years. And then it says, it says at the 400 years or after the 400 years? It says they shall come out after 400 after years. After 400 years. So sometime, sometime thereafter, right after 400 years or so, it looks like in the Bible, that they will come out of Egypt. Now, now the reason I bring this up right here, I, um, this is a kind of a, a little bit of a difficult part of the study, and I, 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 it depends on who I'm studying with or if I'm preaching it or whatever. I bring up a pretty interesting point right here because the Bible says that the children of Israel were there for how long? How long were, did they go in bondage? Remember the prophecy here is that, that his children, the children of Israel or his descendants would be in bondage for how long? 400 years. Were they there for 400 years? No. They was actually there for 430 years. And so... Now, I'm going to bring this up right here just to answer an objection that may come up. If it doesn't come up, don't deal with it. I mean, you can't answer the objection. The short way of answering this objection is to simply say, hey, were they, it, says that, it says, as Tom read there, that it would be after 400 years they would come out. 430 years after 400? For sure it is. It's after 400 years. But I like, I like to bring up another point. And uh, let's go to Exodus. Now, this is, just a, this is separate from what you would normally give in the study, but this is just extra in case, in case the objections come up and that kind of thing. Let's go to Exodus chapter 12 for a minute. This is not on your study guide. You know it's not on the slides or, or on your study guide, so this is one of those places you'd have to take an extra note if you want to keep track of this. I'm going to read verse 40. It says, Exodus chapter 12 and verse 40, Now the sojourning of the children of Israel who dwelt in Egypt was four hundred and... 30 years. Isn't that fascinating? And it says, and it came to pass at the end of the 430 years, even the selfsame day it came to pass that all the hosts of the Lord went out from the land of Egypt. Now, I've had people tell me, say, well, well, wait a minute. It was 430 years from the time they got there till they were delivered, but it was, it was um, 400 years in bondage. Not true. It's not true because when you, I, I went and done a little research, and I can give you the information on this either on a, at a different time or a different study because it takes a little while. But basically, when Joseph became prime minister of Egypt, he was 30 years old. The Bible tells us so. He was 30 years old. And so if you, take, if you add 14 to that, because you remember it had seven years of, of, of good and seven years of famine. So let's just take a full 14 years, and that makes him how old? 44. At the end of that time, somewhere between in, the, in that last seven years, by the time between, between him being 30 and 44, actually between 37 and 44, somewhere in that time frame, the children of Israel came down to Egypt. Remember his family came down when the famine got so bad at, toward the end of the seven years? You remember that taking place? And then he dies, Joseph dies at like 100, and I don't remember the exact time, it was like 130 years old when he dies, or some, something like that. And anyway, it turns out to be like 60 years that the children of Israel would, be, would have been down there before Joseph dies. 
Okay, so there's 60 years that they were actually in Egypt before Joseph died. And then it says, after Joseph dies, another king arises that does not know Joseph or appreciate what he's done, and he puts him in bondage. So there had to be a time span even after Joseph died before someone even forgot the good things that Joseph had done and took the children of Israel into bondage. So, so to say it was 430 years because 30 years was the time they were just in Egypt doesn't fit. It just doesn't fit that. But I think something that, that there's, a good, there's an answer that's actually better than, than to say, to try to answer all that that way, you know. It, the bottom line, and the Tom, Tom picked it up when he read his study there, it says there in Genesis that after 400 years they'll be delivered. And 430 is after 400. Right? It definitely fits that. But I, I, there's another answer that, that's found in Acts chapter 7. And I'm going to take a little time and show that. Do you guys want to see that? I mean, it, it, to me, it just it kind of makes sense. Because here's what I want to say. How long did Abraham say they'd be in bondage? 400, 400 years. How long were they there? 400. Okay, so Abram's a false prophet. Do you feel comfortable with that? Abraham's a false prophet. He's not a biblical prophet, is he? Because he's a false prophet. If he, if he gives a prophecy and it's in the Bible and says 400 years and it actually was 430 years in bondage, that makes him a false prophet, doesn't it? I know, <laughs> it stirs us up, doesn't it? Prophet, right? pick, your, pick your thing up there and talk. <laughs> but after the 400 years, he raises up another prophet, up right? right? Yeah, that, that's, that's, that's sort of true. But now think about this. Today, if we're going to measure a prophet, We've got to use the same standards with the old prophets as we do with the new prophets. If you have a new prophet come along and, and give a prophecy, and they say, after 20 years this is going to happen, and it doesn't happen, are you going to reject them? Sure, you're going to say they're not a prophet. Yeah. But we look at Abraham, and he says 400 years, and it was 430, and, and, and you say, do you want to reject him? Obviously, there's something wrong with, with our understanding of the prophecy, isn't there? Because we know that Abraham's not a false prophet. And, and we're going to look at a couple of things here that, that I think will help clar clarify this. But I want to ask you this. If the Internet was around in the days of Abraham, after he, after he passed on, you know, and the children of Israel there in Egypt, right? And they look at the prophecy, and it says 400 years will be in bondage, and it gets to 410 years. What do you suppose the Internet and the church folk would be saying about Abraham in that time frame, the contemporaries? He's a false prophet. Right? Wouldn't they be saying that? Because it's 410 years into this whole thing, and we're not delivered yet, and, and the prophecy he gave was 400 years. Can you imagine what they've been thinking? Fascinating, isn't it, to think about. Go with me to the book of Acts now. Acts chapter 7. Yeah, and all this stuff is extra. If the objection comes up, you know, here's, here's the answer to the objections. It's, it's a little more time-consuming, I realize, to do this. But I, I think it, if we, if we kind of work through this a little bit, we can, we can get the good answers, even for ourselves. Don't you want to know, know what God's doing? I mean, it almost, when I first saw this, it, it troubled me. Does it trouble you a little bit to think that maybe Abraham will be a false prophet if he said 400 years and it's 430? Don't feel comfortable saying that, do you? And, and, and I, think, I think we got the answer here in Acts chapter 7. Um, this is uh, Stephen's. This is Stephen's um, sermon, and it's like the best sermon he ever preached. Right? You know it's the best sermon he ever preached. How do you know that? Because they killed him at the end. That's exactly right. When they kill you at the end of the sermon, it must have been a good one, right? And so Stephen here is preaching to, to, the, to the leaders of, of, of Israel. And Jessica is going to do some reading here for us. And I'm going to give you a, a verse to read. And then we're going to stop you and go to another verse, that kind of thing, okay? So first of all, read verse 6 for me. Uh, Acts chapter 7, verse 6. But God also told him that his descendants would live in a foreign country where they would be mistreated as slaves for 400 years. So he's, he's bringing up the whole, he, he's going through the history of Israel, and, he, and, he's, and he's coming up to the point of Joseph here, and he says that God told Abraham that they would, they would be 400 years in bondage, and he's, and he's leading on up through, and he goes through some more of the history. Now pick it up to verse 16. Actually, verse 15 would be good. 15 and 16, start reading there. So Jacob went to Egypt. He died there, as did all his sons. Six all of them were taken to Shechem mm -hmm. and buried in the tomb Abraham had bought from the sons of Hamor in Shechem. Okay, verse 17. As the time drew near when God would fulfill his okay. promise. Okay, there you go. As the time drew near for, well, that when God would fulfill his promise, fulfill his promise that he promised to Abraham. Abraham. Okay, what promise would that be talking about? The 400-year prophecy, right? So as that time drew near, the, Stephen says, as that time drew near, God done something. What did he do, Jessica? The number of our people in Egypt greatly increased. Keep going. 
But then a new king came to the throne of Egypt who knew nothing about Joseph. This king plotted against our people and forced parents to abandon their newborn babies so they would die. One more verse. At that time, Moses was born. Okay, at what time? At that 400. At, right, at the, at the end, the promise is drawing nigh, it's getting close, he says the promise is getting close, and in that time, when it's getting close to that time of, of their deliverance, you know, that's what the context is here, in that time, Moses is born. So Moses is coming along right at the right time, right? He's coming up at the right, at, at the time, all right? Um, I'm going to go ahead and read some more of this myself, because I want to emphasize a few things, okay? In which time Moses was born, and was exceedingly fair, and nourished up in his father's house for three months. And then it goes on talking about Moses a little bit. I'm just going to, I'll just go ahead and keep reading verse 21. And when he was cast out, Pharaoh's daughter took him up and nourished him as her own son. And when Moses was, Moses was learned in all the wisdom of the Egyptians, and was a mighty, mighty in words and in deeds, and when he was a full 40 years old, it came into his heart to visit his brethren, the children of Israel. Who do you suppose put it into his heart? Why would it come into Moses' heart? Because God is putting it there, right? I mean, you think about it. If you're living in the palace, you're, living in the, you're, you're the king's son, you got it made. Why would you want to go visit those, those, you know, those slaves? Mm -hmm. But God's putting it on his heart, right? And, when, and so he goes out in verse 24. He saw one of them suffered wrong. He defended him, avenged him, and that was oppressed, and smote the Egyptian. For he supposed that his brethren would understand how that God, by his hand, Moses' hand, would deliver them, but they understood not. You know what happens here? The children of Israel, as God is putting it in Moses' heart to go start delivering them, maybe go start that process, Moses goes out, he messes up. I've got to admit, I think he messed up there when he killed the Egyptian. But God was going to use Moses to start delivering the children of Israel on time. But they did not understand. And you know what the children of Israel did? They rejected the prophet that God was raising up. They rejected him. Right? Did they reject Moses? Remember, when God was bringing Moses, and it says here that God would put it in Moses' heart to come and deliver them. Because the time was drawing near. That's what, the, that's what uh, uh, Stephen's saying in this sermon. He says the time was drawing near. It was getting close to that time. God had put it in Moses' heart to come and deliver your ancestors, but they rejected Moses. They didn't understand. And so it ended up costing them, I believe, an extra 30 years in bondage because they rejected the prophet. Now this is very significant, especially as we get into the later on in the spirit of prophecy study and we look at the latter-day prophets. There's some significance to this. So are you, you understanding this? We're not willing to object to, uh, we're not willing to call Abraham a false prophet. Are you? I'm not willing to do that. I mean, because he's biblical, he makes perfect, everything makes perfect sense. And when you look at what happened here, if the children, God's people, if the church rejects the prophet, it costs them more time. But still, still, in the same way, as, as we go back to Genesis chapter 15 now, um, Genesis chapter, oh, actually, we're going to the next text, I'm sorry. Genesis 15 was the prophecy, the timeline prophecy given that was, the, um, that was given for the 400 years. Now we're going to go to Exodus chapter 3 and verse 7 through 10, and we're going to see that God did raise somebody up, it being Moses, as we have already discovered, and that he raised him up to deliver the children of Israel. Now, everything we've done from, from the time we I had Tom read his text there in Genesis chapter 15, from after he got done reading his text, everything I've done from there till now, you don't normally have to share in a Bible study. Okay? What's the short answer? If, if somebody says, but wait, they was there for 430 years, what's the short answer to that, to that question if you don't want to go into full detail? It says after 400 years. It says after 400 years. 430 is after 400. But now if you want to go into a little more detail and make the point, you go to the book of Acts, and, and Acts chapter 7, and just ask that question. You know, it's very interesting that Stephen says, in which time? In this time, you know, he's raised up but they rejected him. You reject the prophet, it costs you more time. Did God want to deliver them at the end of 400 years period? Yes. Absolutely. But if you're not ready, is he going to deliver you anyway? No. And if you notice the history of the children of Israel, as they're going into the promised land, why didn't they go directly into the promised land? Because God had to take a certain amount of time and prepare them to get ready to go to the promised land. They finally got there and didn't go in because of the rebellion. Ended up being another 40 years before they went. Now, did God want to wait another 40 years to take them to the promised land? No. But why did he have to wait? Because of them. So the prophet was conditional, wasn't it? The prophecy was conditional. He wanted to take them right in, but their hearts were hard. He wanted, to he wanted to deliver them, I believe, through Moses pretty quickly, but their hearts were hard. You know, they wasn't ready to accept the prophet. So now let's go to Exodus chapter 3. Does that make sense? Okay. Exodus chapter 3. If it doesn't make sense to you, then it's not going to make sense to them at home. So you can say, no, it doesn't make sense. I won't pin you down on a, on a like, well, what doesn't make sense about it? Too much. But you give me just a general idea and I'll try to explain it. Because you know if, if it's not making sense here, then it's not making sense there, right? 
Okay, Exodus chapter 3. And who would like to read that? Verse 7 through 10. Do I have a volunteer? Uh, okay, um, Miss Gloria. Exodus chapter 3, 7 through 10. And the Lord said, I have surely seen the oppression of my people who are in Egypt and have heard their cry because of their taskmasters, for I know their sorrows. So I have come down to deliver them out of the hand of the Egyptians and to bring them up from the land to a good and large land, to a land flowing with milk and honey, to the place of the Canaanites and the Hittites and the Amazites and the Perizzites and to the Havites and the Jebusites. Jebusites, right, go ahead. Now therefore, behold the cry of the children of Israel has come to me, and I have also seen the oppression with which the Egyptians oppressed them. Come now, therefore, and I will send you to Pharaoh that you may bring my people, the children of Israel, out of Egypt. So God now is coming down to Moses. Moses has been in the wilderness for, for quite a while now, about 40 years. And remember, remember it, was, it, was, it was 40 years prior to this that he, was, he had put it on Moses' heart to visit the children of Israel. And then this is 40 years later. And God, God is calling... God is calling Moses now and says, okay, we're going to go deliver the people now, the children of Israel. The timeline prophecy has come to an end. It's well past. Now we're going to, I've heard the cry of them. They're crying and they're whining and complaining because of all the affliction that's going on with them in Egypt. They're in bondage. They don't want to be in bondage anymore. You can kind of imagine the scenario, right? So he raises up a prophet at the end of this timeline prophecy to go back and fulfill the timeline prophecy that has been given. Right? Let us look at it on the screen. You first of all had Enoch. Enoch gave a timeline prophecy. At the end of the timeline prophecy, Noah raised up and, 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 and delivered, was, was the deliverer at the end of that timeline prophecy. And then you find Abraham, Abram, who eventually became Abraham after he had his, had his, has his son. So Abram, he gives a timeline prophecy. God gives him a message, and he says, 400 years, 400 years they're going to be in bondage. At the end of the 400 years, they're going to come out, or after, actually, the 400 years they're going to come out. And so, does God leave the children of Israel to wonder, like, okay, the 400 years is up, and all of a sudden God's just going to make all the Egyptians fall down dead, and the children of Israel march out? Is that what happened? No, he raised up another prophet at the end of that timeline. He comes back and he says to the people, you need to prepare yourselves. And you remember through the plague how God used that to prepare them to leave. Especially the last plague, where the firstborn was killed, they had to, it had to be a, such a total thing of faith for the children of Israel. Moses said, you've got to go and put blood from a lamb over your doorpost, and that'll keep your son from dying. Doesn't that sound weird? But you know what? If you didn't do it, you want me to tell you what would happen? Your, old, your firstborn would die. So it's, it's really interesting to me that, that God would raise up a prophet at the end of that timeline and say, okay, it's time to be delivered. I've got to prepare you for deliverance. Once again, so you have two timeline prophecies in the Bible given by a prophet, and at the end of that timeline prophecy, another prophet being ra ra raising up to, to announce the deliverance. Is everybody seeing a pattern develop here? Yeah, you, you see what's going on with the pattern? Now, think about it. In the days of Noah... Let's suppose that we had Google in the days of Noah. What do you think Google would have been saying about Noah? That's a crazy cult, right? A crazy old man building a boat in the middle of dry land. It's just, it's just never happened before. Nothing's going to happen. They would have, he would have been slammed. But you know what turns out? Noah was right. Google would have been wrong. <laughs> now, you all know that Google, I'm not talking about Google being a person. It's just anybody can go on the Internet and put anything out on the Internet, making that point, right? Same way with Abraham and Moses. But now we're going to look at another timeline prophecy, Jeremiah. Now, Jeremiah is one of my all-time favorites, because with Jeremiah, you know what you find with him? Not one person, you can read the whole book of Jeremiah, you don't find any time not where one person listens to even one thing that Jeremiah has to say. Nobody. Would you be discouraged? Like, every time you, hold, you preach a sermon in a church, every time you go to hold an evangelistic series, every time you go do anything and preach a message, no one pays any attention to you. They say you're wrong, they make fun of you, can you imagine? That's Jeremiah. So, <laughs> let us go to Jeremiah now, chapter 29. Jeremiah 29, and we're going to read verses 4 through 10, and I, I think that uh, Roberto is going to read that for us, and, and if it gets a little too late, laborious for you, Roberto, reading all those texts, I'll pick up and help you out some, okay? okay. And, and so he's going to read uh, Jeremiah chapter 29, verses 4 through 10. Thus says the Lord of, of hosts, the God of Israel, to all who were carried away captive, whom I have caused to be carried away from Jerusalem to Babylon. Build houses and dwell in them, plant gardens and eat their fruit. 
that wives have and begot sons and daughters and take wives for your sons and give your daughters to husband to that they may bear sons and daughters that you may be increased there and not diminished diminish. Okay, hold it just there for a second. So, so what, basically what's going on here is Jeremiah is given a prophecy. God told Jeremiah, tell the people, tell the people that they're going away to Babylon, they're going to be captives in Babylon. Get used to the idea. Go ahead and marry wives, go ahead and have sons and daughters, go ahead and build houses because that's where you're going. You're going to go there. Now, all the, the, the modern day preachers, the ones with the big mega churches and all the local churches, everybody, and all the pastors and, and the elders and everybody, Every religious person, basically, in the whole town of Jerusalem was making fun of Jeremiah. And you're going to, you'll pick that up as you read through the rest of this. You'll see that. I want to lay, kind of lay the groundwork. So now as you hear it read, it'll kind of make sense. They're saying, uh, all the so-called prophets were saying, Jeremiah's nuts. God is with us. He's going to protect us. Everything's going to be just fine. As a matter of fact, they would say, I've had this vision. I've had this dream, and I'm going to prophesy over you. And I'm going to tell you that God, we're God's chosen people, and nothing's going to happen to us. Okay? That's what the prophets were saying. That's what the leaders were saying. And if you read Jeremiah chapter 1, one of the things I really appreciate about Jeremiah was he was really young, very young, and very intimidated about when God put the call on him. He's like, I can't go. I'm but a child. And God says, don't say you're but a child, Jeremiah chapter 1. Don't say you're but a child. I have sent you. Go. Kind of the same thing he did with Moses. Moses says, I can't speak to Pharaoh. I have uncircumcised lips. And God says, don't say that. Go. And these guys eventually obeyed. But they're very, they were very intimidated, very, very shy about delivering the message that God had them to deliver. Okay, so Jeremiah here, he didn't really want to deliver the message, but he faithfully did it. And he said, don't listen. You'll find, read it here in just a minute. Don't listen to your prophets that, that dream false dreams and, and, your, and your sorcerers and these other guys that are saying things that aren't true. But here's what God has to say. Now read it to us. Now that we have an idea of what it's going to be saying. And seek the peace of the city where I have caused to you to carry away captives. captives. And pray the Lord to the Lord for it. For in its, for in its peace... You will have peace. For thus you say the Lord of hosts, the God of Israel, say the Lord of hosts, the God of Israel, do not let your prophets and your, your diviners who are in your midst deceive you. Nor listen to your dreams uh, which you cause to be dreamed. Fascinating. I'm going to stop you right there for a second. See what he says there? Don't listen to, your, to the, the, the prophets and the diviners in the midst of you, and, and don't listen to the dreams which you have caused to be dreamed. In other words, it's like, we want this to happen, so a prophet would come along and say, oh, this is going to happen. And we would all say, oh, we love this prophet because he tells us what we want to hear. Do you understand what is, what's happening here? Jeremiah was telling the people not what they wanted to hear. And so Jeremiah said, now you've got these other prophets here. You have these other prophets that are telling you what you want to hear. They're, in other words, they're having dreams that you've caused them to dream because the very fact that, that you've, you want this to happen, and they say, oh, I had a dream, and that's exactly what's going to happen. They're saying, oh, he must be a true prophet. Isn't it funny how they're willing to embrace, all of us too, we're willing to embrace prophets if they're going to tell us something good about us. You know, I've been around a lot of people that, 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 that's in different religious movements, and they'll say, yeah, I was prophesied over at church. And it would say, and, and in the prophecy, he told me I was going to be rich, and I was going to marry a good-looking girl or guy, whatever the case may be, you know. And, and it, the, the prophecies always come, and it's always the pleasing things, right? Yeah, I never had anybody come up to me and say, yeah, I was prophesied over at church, and they told me I was going to die in a car wreck tomorrow, you know. <laughs> Nothing like that. You never hear those kind of things. It's always the pleasing things that we want to hear. And the Bible says it will be the same way in the last days. But go ahead. This is what's happening right now. For they prophesy falsely to you in my name. I have not sent them say the Lord. But thus say the Lord after 70 years. How long? 70. 70 years. Years are complete in ba at Babylon. I will visit you and perform my good work to, toward you and cause you to return to this place. Perfect. So how long are they going to be in Babylon according to Jeremiah the prophet? 70 years. Now, this is another what we would call timeline prophecy, right? He's given a timeline prophecy. For 70 years, you're going to be in bondage in Babylon. And then after the 70 years, I'm going to perform my good word toward you, and I'm going to deliver you. So that's what he's promised them. It's a guarantee thing, right? You know, <laughs> Internet was around in Jeremiah's day. You know, you can imagine what you could have Googled about him. None of us would have followed Jeremiah. I'm convinced of that. Not one of us would have, would have liked to listen to Jeremiah and what he had to say. As a matter of fact, one of the people who we hold in high regard as a prophet, even today. Uh, his name is Daniel. 
Um, I think there's strong biblical evidence, and we're going to look at it here in just a minute, that Daniel also did not follow Jeremiah as a prophet until later on in life. Like, Jer Daniel was, was, in, was in Jerusalem. He was in the city while Jeremiah was saying these things right here. He would have been living right here. Jeremiah was a contemporary of his. Okay, so as Jeremiah is saying you're going to go away to bondage for 70 years, Daniel would have been one of the young people in the city that would have heard that prophecy. But he's likely, like many of us, would have said, well, that's, the majority is not following Jeremiah the prophet. The majority is not going along with what Jeremiah the prophet is saying. So who do you think we would follow? Jeremiah? We would like to think so, wouldn't we? But my guess is m many of us, probably every one of us, would have said, well, no, the prophets, the priests, the leaders in the church, they can't all be wrong. Jeremiah must be wrong. Are you following that idea? And we know that's the case because as we go to our next text, it's going to be on the screen here, Daniel chapter 9. Daniel chapter 9 and verse 2 is where we're going to next. This is the sixth spirit of prophecy um, um, text we're going to be turning to in the study, 6 SP. And we just came from Jeremiah 29. We're going to Daniel chapter 9. That's to the right of Jeremiah. So you go Jeremiah, and then you go to, uh, after Jeremiah, you got Lamentations and Ezekiel, and you go to the book of Daniel. Lamentations, Ezekiel, Daniel, the latter part of Daniel, Daniel chapter 9. And um, we're going to pick start in verse 2, and then I'm going to stop whoever reads, and then we're going to make some, quite a minute commenting. And Danielle is going to read for us. She's all ready to read. Uh, Daniel chapter 9, verse 2. Go ahead. In the first year of his reign, I, Daniel, understood by books the number of the years whereof the word of the Lord came to Jeremiah the prophet, that he would accomplish 70 years in the desolations of Jerusalem. So at the end of the 70-year time frame, Daniel's still alive. He's an old man by now, probably in his early 90s or whatever, and he, and he, and he, starts, he starts thinking about, I can just picture Daniel now, he's, he's thinking about like, um, the, the old days and what was going on back in Jerusalem when he was young, and, and perhaps he, he just gets out the book of Jeremiah the prophet. Notice that Daniel calls a contemporary of himself. In other words, living in the same time frame, he calls him a prophet and is calling his writings, Jeremiah's writings, prophetic, right? And so he's reading the prophecy of Jeremiah, and he says, oh, he said 70 years. Now, why is it Daniel had faith and believed that the 70 years would come to pass? It's because that everything that Jeremiah the prophet had said had taken place. And so Jeremiah gives a 70-year time prophecy. Daniel realizes 70 years is coming to an end. And, I'm, and, and notice what he says when he begins this prayer. I think it's very fascinating. Remember I told you I think that Daniel was one of the young people that didn't listen to Jeremiah? Daniel confesses that himself. Uh, he starts this prayer in Daniel chapter 9. He said, I set my face in verse 3. I set my face to the Lord in prayer uh, to, to seek by prayer and supplications and fasting and sackcloth and ashes. I prayed unto the Lord my God, and I made confession and said, O Lord, great and dreadful God, keeping the covenant and mercy to them that love him and them that keep his commandments. Who does God keep his covenant with? Those that keep his commandments, right? Love him and keep his commandments. We have sinned. We, we would include who? Daniel. We. We have sinned. We have committed iniquity. We've done wickedly. We have rebelled in departing from your precepts and your judgments. Now look what it says next. Neither have we listened... To your servants, the prophets, which spake in, you, in your name to our kings, our princes, our fathers, and to all the people of the land. So Daniel's putting himself with all the rest of them and said, you know what? We didn't listen to your prophets. Though, and so he just reads the book of Jeremiah. He realized we should have listened. If we would have listened to Jeremiah, we would have caused ourselves a whole lot less headache, right? If our people, if our princes, if myself would have listened to Jeremiah, maybe all this wouldn't have happened the way it did. Because he was prophesying that these things would happen, we didn't listen to him. Because you, you'll notice prior to, to Jeremiah, the 29th chapter, where we just came from, prior to that, Jeremiah's prophecy was along the lines of trying to get the people to repent, turn back to God. And because they refused to, to do what God had asked them to do, he says, okay, God's, getting, God's had enough of you, you're now going to go in bondage for 70 years. Daniel recognizes that. So God gives a timeline prophecy through Enoch. At the end of that timeline prophecy, God raises up Noah. Then he gives a timeline prophecy through Abram. And at the end of that timeline prophecy, God raises up Moses. And then God gives another timeline prophecy through Jeremiah the prophet. And at the end of that timeline prophecy, God raises up another prophet by the name of Daniel. And Daniel says, hey, you know what? This 70 years is coming to an end. We need to get ready. And he delivers the message to the people. Do you see a biblical pattern here, what God does? When God gives a timeline prophecy... He never leaves his people in the dark about the end of the timeline prophecy. It wouldn't seem fair, would it, that you would do that? Like, 
to tell them that this is going to happen at the end of the timeline prophecy, and it's a long time, 70 years is a long time, everybody's forgotten what was said, they're all in darkness, and they're wondering what's going to happen, for God just to leave it to go, to go blank, and no one understands that he was getting ready to be delivered, and then deliver them all of a sudden, I mean, that would be a nice thing to have a present like that, wouldn't it? But God wants to prepare his people for their deliverance. When these timeline prophecies come to an end, God wants to have his people prepared. He wants us to be ready. He doesn't want to just blindside us and us not know what's going to happen. So are you seeing the biblical pattern here? Yep. It continues. It continues. Let's look at the next one. On the screen, the next one we're going to is Daniel chapter 9 and verse 25. Daniel 9 and 25. Did you know that Daniel gave another timeline prophecy himself? He gives a timeline prophecy Daniel does here. Now, you've already studied this timeline prophecy here with Pastor Scott when he'd when he done the 70 week prophecy or, or Daniel chapter 9 in, in, the, in the study. He'd done Daniel chapter 9 with you. So we've already seen this one before. And what we're looking at now is that this timeline prophecy, when he gives it, God is going to raise up another prophet at the end of it to announce it's coming to an end. So let us look at it. Daniel 9, chapter 25, and Tom is going to read that for us. Daniel chapter 9 and verse 25. Know therefore and understand that from the going forth of the command to restore and build Jerusalem until Messiah the Prince, there shall be seven weeks and sixty-two weeks, the street shall be built again, and the wall, even in troublesome times. So you remember that prophecy? Do you remember what took place? It was, it was 69 weeks. He just read there. At the end of 69 weeks, what was going to happen? The uh, street shall be built again. Well, the Messiah would come. Remember? It says, it says, from the commandment that goes forth to rebuild and restore Jerusalem until Messiah the Prince will be 69 weeks. So you're, we're looking for the Messiah to come at the end of 69 weeks. Now, that's a timeline prophecy. Does God raise up another prophet at the end of the 69 weeks? To let him know that, hey, you know what? You better get ready because the Messiah is here. Who would it be? John the, John the Baptist. Let us look at it. Mark, it's on the slide here. Go to the next slide as we go to the 8th Spirit of Prophecy study here. Mark chapter 1, verses 1 through 3 and verse 15. So Mark, we're going to the right. We're in the Old Testament book of Daniel. We're going to the right. We'll go find the book of Matthew in the New Testament. And then the next book will be the book of Mark. Mark chapter 1. And God done exactly what he said he would do. He raises up another prophet. Now, Mike is going to read Mark. Mark chapter 1, and read verses 1 through... Actually, just do 1 through 4. 1 through 3 is fine, but let's, let's just pick up 1 through 4 here. Right. The beginning of the gospel of Jesus Christ, the Son of God. As it is written in the prophets, Behold, I send my messenger before thy face, which shall prepare thy way before thee. The voice of one crying in the wilderness, Prepare ye the way of the Lord, make his path straight. John did baptize in the wilderness and preached the baptism of, remit, of repentance for the remission of sins. So, so it's getting close to the Messiah to be here, right? John the Baptist is coming along. He's preaching. It says how it's worded there in Mark chapter 1, in the beginning of the gospel of Jesus Christ. So, so John here is preaching about the gospel of Jesus Christ. He says, as it is written in the prophets, I'm sending my messenger before thy face. And this messenger was? It was John the Baptist. And he'd come preaching the, the baptism of repentance for the remission of sins. I think it's very interesting when, my, when Mike reads our next text here in, in Mark chapter, chapter 1 and verse 15, when he gets to that text, you're going to find it's very interesting what Jesus says as he begins the, the, um, the, the, his explanation of John, basically. John has just baptized Jesus, and Jesus comes along with another message, Mike. And what is that message that Jesus comes along with? And saying, the time is fulfilled. What time? The time prophecy. What time prophecy is that? The coming of the Messiah. The 69 weeks, right? He said it's fulfilled. Carry on. And the kingdom of God is at hand. Repent ye and believe the gospel. Isn't that fascinating? That just right on time, Jesus comes along after John comes along and announcing the end of the 69 weeks, Mike. He comes along announcing the end of the 69 weeks. And then Jesus comes and says what? The time is fulfilled. What time? You know it. It's the 69 weeks. Powerful, isn't it? So what God's establishing this pattern, and this pattern continues through the Bible. It starts off with, with, um, with Enoch giving a timeline prophecy. And then it goes on from there to... After the timeline prophecy, Noah comes along, then Abram, and then Moses, and then Jeremiah, and Daniel. Daniel gives a timeline prophecy, and at the end of Daniel's timeline prophecy, God does not leave his people in the dark. He comes with this powerful message. Now, by the way, it's getting more into modern time, and I want you to think about John. John wore strange clothes. John ate strange food. And John had a strange message that was different than anybody else was wearing, eating, and preaching in that day. Isn't that interesting? And so, and so John's message here, as he comes along preaching, is, is basically, um, repent, 
turned back. The Messiah is coming. He's, he's preparing the way for the Messiah. And he's fulfilling the end of the timeline prophecy. He's coming to the end of this timeline prophecy. And he says, you need to get ready. You need to get ready. The Messiah is coming. And so he announces that Jesus is going to come. He announces the end of the 69 weeks. And I suppose, I just, I just suppose, I can imagine, if the internet was around in the day of John the Baptist, what they would have been saying about him. This strange guy living out in the wilderness, wearing this odd clothing, you know, uh, unlike what everybody else is wearing in the day, preaching this strange message, unlike what everybody else is preaching, he must be the leader of a cult. No one go listen. As a matter of fact, you can remember what the, people, the, the, the leaders said about Jesus. We're not following him. <laughs> right? And after John the Baptist points to Jesus, no one else wanted to follow because, well, the leaders weren't doing it. Now, Daniel gives another timeline prophecy. John the Baptist is raised up to announce the end of the timeline prophecy. Daniel gives another timeline prophecy. And, oh, I'm so sorry. You've got to wait until our next study to find out what his next timeline prophecy is and who announces the end of that. And it's a perfect time to end right here. So we, we've got about a half a minute left to go here on, on the video, and, and then we're going to take a little break here. I'll let you guys get a water break. I'll take one myself. And I want, to, I want to encourage the people at home to continue to follow along. You want to come back and catch the rest of this study. You don't want to miss it because you get to find out how God finishes the next timeline prophecy and who the following prophet was that he raised up at the end of that. So Daniel gives another timeline prophecy. That's where we're going to next.